folks, and thank you all so much for coming up to the fourth and A's in our age over the next 20 minutes, we're going to be questions that you submitted to us this week in our fourth lecture, looking at the, the flapper phenomenon. Uh, so we've got a lot of really interesting themes to dive into this week. So I think we'll, we'll jump right into it now. Uh, and I'd like to ask you all to join me in giving a warm welcome to your Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Uh, as you can hear, Will is sort of drifting in and out on us, but we know he's there in heart. So, uh, yeah, um, I wanted to uh, talk about some of the questions to do with that triptych. Will alerted me that there were several questions uh, about that. Will, you should just jump in at this point if there was something else you wanted to say about them. Apologies uh, again, folks. I'm having some uh, issues with my connect. Just clearly enough to get this first question in. Um, as Peter mentioned, on getting triptych featured, uh, Wendy Keen wrote in to ask um, if he could comment on uh, the the two images that surround the inner portion that Peter discussed. So the P, the intersect. I'll hand it over to share with you. Oh, okay. Thanks for that, Will. Now, um, I've actually, uh, I am very fond of that triptych, I must say. And so I was delighted to, I'm just going to switch now to sharing my screen, if you'll bear with me for a, a minute. Okay, so you should see me and um, uh, up on the side there and uh, a high quality image of that triptych of Otto Dix from 1928. And uh, as Will was mentioning, it's a triptych and that in itself is actually a satirical comment because triptychs traditionally in German and European art history were medieval religious screens that uh, were often put behind the high altar of, of a church with a central panel and the two side ones that folded and sometimes this is going with this. Now that, uh, first of all, that central panel, let me just comment a little bit on that. You can see just behind those four vertical bars, there's one uh, black musician in the group and two saxophones, one just at the front uh, left part here and quite central in the picture is another man playing a saxophone. Well, Dix was living in Dresden in Saxony when he painted this. And so this is uh, some very local uh, references he's making. The man playing the saxophone is actually uh, Alfred Schulze, who was um, the minister for culture in uh, Saxony, where Dr the state in which Dresden is located. And so Dix is picking up on some local figures. And there's another one, I think if you can follow my uh, Wilhelm Kreis. And there's actually some commentary that suggests that the woman uh, facing uh, just in front of him is actually a portrait of Otto Dix's wife, Marta. Um, but I, I can't be sure of that. And some even suggest that the man dancing here is a portrait of Otto Dix himself. In any case, Dix is playing on the notion of saxophone and Saxony, Saxon and saxophone. So there's all, there's the, that sly little pun going on there. Um, now the panel to the left of this main one, as you face it, is this one. And you can see this man is a double amputee lying on the ground, maybe dead, maybe drunk, maybe hopeless, we don't know. And there are some 
of women, these are all prostitutes here. You can tell by the clothing, the garish clothing and the amputee prosthetic limbs and, and the crutch and the dog howling at them, a really savage portrait. And you can see the architecture here is kind of like a Gothic arch. And when we switch to the next one, the, the other panel, these are also uh, prostitutes. And you see there is another war veteran, another double amputee uh, sitting on the ground and kind of waving to this parade of women who are also prostitutes. And uh, as has been noted by art historians, you can see this woman, Otto Dix is depicting female, uh, the female genital organs there. Uh, there. He doesn't pull his punches. And then there, it, the picture subsides into this, uh, off to the right in this fantastical architecture. So this is really quite a dazzling and uh, outrageous painting to suggest that the religious triptychs of the 15, 14, 15, 1600s have now degenerated into this decadent picture of Berlin, well, Dresden, of Germany uh, in the mid 1920s. And uh, Dix, I've showed you some pictures of George Gross before. Well, Dix was also uh, very much in the same category as him. And in fact, there's a, a new, fairly new modern gallery in Berlin called the Berlin Gallery, Berlinische Galerie, for when we're able to go to Berlin again. It's right behind the famous Jewish Museum in Berlin and the coffee shop and restaurant there in that new modern gallery is the Otto Dix Cafe. So you can uh, revel or be shocked by whatever is going on here. Now, uh, I'm just gonna continue on, Will, um, because another question was about how widespread the flapper movement was. And well, I'm on a roll, I hope, uh, I'll just continue. So here's the next one on that sequence. Somebody asked, well, were the flappers just the bad girls or how widespread was this? And what class of society uh, were the flappers? Well, it certainly was the kind of flapper I've been picturing was certainly a big city urban phenomenon. So New York, Boston, Chicago, Los Angeles. But that style permeated through the whole culture of North America. And what I'm showing you here is a page from a catalog of a mail order catalog from the United States in 1927. So you can see hats and the bobbed hairdos and the raised hemline. Uh, and the lowered waistline, and uh, perhaps more modest, some of them in the neckline, but you living in Mason City, Iowa, um, could get your very own flapper outfit. Not that you would be going to the same kind of uh, speakeasies with their riotous comportment and uh, lots of illegal drinking, but you could certainly look the part. And somebody else asked, I believe, was this also common in Canada? Well, there's a page from the Eaton catalog of, in Montreal in 1926. And you can see, yes, even our dear Eaton's was uh, heavily importing the uh, effect of the flapper outfit. So anywhere, and you could look like a flapper in Montreal or Trois-Rivières or in a bigger Saskatchewan or wherever. This was right across the country, the look, if not the lifestyle. And uh, the, another question revolved around how widespread was this? Uh, was it just... French, Germany, and the United States. Well, as you can see, it was Canada, at least in the big cities. Um, and was it just upper class white girls? Well, there were a lot of working single young women, white, who 
had uh, taken jobs during the war and continued in a lot of those. So they had some disposable income, but that picture uh, to the left, uh, on your left as you face the screen are black flappers in Harlem in the mid 1920s, because it also had its own uh, very rich culture. But the clothing styles, you can see, they're obviously patterned after that. Another flapper here on the right, this is Susie Saxophone, a still from a Czechoslovakian film. So yes, that style was happening there too. And here are some flappers in London. There's two flappers uh, on your left as you face the screen, leaving a London uh, night hall dance club. You can see they are certainly wearing a very uh, considerably uplifted hemline there. And here is a tea party in London from 1928. So yes, it was widespread. These are some Danish women and it was and did this happen in asia and latin america i don't know about latin america but it certainly was also happening in asia in japan for instance they talked about the modern girl modern garu uh, which was often shortened to moga so they also uh, looked like that okay i'm going to go off the uh, uh, the powerpoint now enough of that all right, Will, sorry to digress there, but back to you. Questions that folks had represented a kind of a broad swath of humanity. Um, it, it wasn't just upper income or white women as one questioner uh, asked. Yeah. Um, you could actually, people of various backgrounds could go to their local department store and look at the- I have a wonderful picture of my grandfather and his wife and their daughter, my aunt, at a Shriners formal event in 1928. Now this, because it was a formal event, all the women are wearing floor length gowns, but every other aspect of uh, their, their makeup, their hairdos and so on are flapper. And so there's a, a source right from my own family that I can authenticate. And all the men are in tuxedos. So uh, yeah, it permeated us, which was the fashion center of the Western world at that point, and particularly Coco Chanel with her little black dress, which I referred to in uh, an earlier lecture. Uh, she was certainly setting the style, but as we know from today, um, other designers pick up on these styles and change them a little bit and call them their own. That still goes on in women's fashions, men's too, for that matter, but uh, less extremely. And uh, so Coco Chanel and other French designers were setting the tone for most of Western North America, and Western Europe, and as I recently learned, and thank you for that question about Asia, was also going on in Japan. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Peter, one last follow-up um, relating to sort of the, the the popular perception of the flappers in their time, the the moral character of the flappers. Um, Anne uh, Guilar uh, wrote in with an interesting question. <laughs> Was every young woman a flapper or was it just the bad girls? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the experiment I asked several friends, what's the first word that comes to your mind when I say the 19th nation for women from those swaddling raiments that they had to wear pre- Was every girl a flapper? Uh, well, lots of them wore flapper outfits as I was just trying to show in that uh, a brief PowerPoint, not all of them uh, carried on like the most infamous aspects of the flapper, the, the smoking, the drinking, the sexual promiscuity, uh, the, the f hopping from one bed to another, uh, the outrageous behavior. Women 
uh, in major cities, particularly New York, to some extent in Toronto, as I mentioned, with that 19th Amendment. Um, in France, it was very much a style thing. Women didn't get the vote in France, by the way, uh, curiously enough, till 19 or they could exercise it. So it's not a simple yes and no, it, or yes or no, it's a yes and no answer to that uh, excellent question. Okay. And very quickly, Peter, one last question, because we're, we're running out of time here. Um, Doris wrote in to ask about the sort of the distinction between the way that flappers would have been perceived by their contemporaries and the way that we perceive them now in the contemporary era. Um, how, how do those perceptions differ? What do we understand about them now that their contemporaries might not have fully appreciate? Well, um, of course, we, we wouldn't appreciate now the, the way that it was such a liberating gesture for young women to wear that clothing in public and to do those other things in public that just hadn't been possible before. Smoking, drinking, dancing, dancing uh, quite wildly to these wonderful uh, new rhythms of jazz, as I've talked about. That that's probably lost in us. We think of them as these uh, sort of Gatsby type women wearing those remarkable outfits. And yes, there was, all, there was a lot more censure of these flighty young immoral flappers as some uh, stentorian conservative voices were having. They saw them as the downfall of civilization when women were allowed to be uh, so outrageously promiscuous. And uh, of course that didn't happen. Um, that was, you get one extreme political viewpoint balancing another and the truth lies somewhere in between. So our retrospective view of it is interesting in that we remain fat about the great Gatsby. Huh? And uh, if you ask, if you think it's of the 20th century, they're going to be flappers or hippies. <laughs> Indeed, yeah, the it's a it's a cultural archetype that still looms large yeah. uh, in our imaginations. Um, well, Peter, I'm afraid that's all the time we've got for now. Um, we've got a great lecture coming to our friends in the audience on Monday, looking at the design movements that flourished uh, uh, in Europe and North America in the 1920s into the 1930s. So a lot to look forward to. In the meantime, a big thank you as always for sharing your insights with us, and have a wonderful weekend. Yes, yeah, same to you, Will, and to all our watchers and listeners there. Thanks for the questions. Look forward to meeting with you again next Monday and next Friday. Bye for now. Bye for now.